Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this presentation, let's examine two poems, sonnets of Michael Drayton, another Elizabethan poet. We will see the historical context and the literary context in which Michael Drayton wrote his poems. We will look at his sonnet collection called Ideas Mirror, published in 1594. For the purpose of this lecture, we will discuss two sonnets. Drayton has an interesting sonnet called Introductory Sonnet to the Readers. We will learn about the kind of sonnet that he has written from this introductory sonnet. Michael Drayton was born in 1563 when Queen Elizabeth was the Queen of England and he continued his life in the second period that is Jacobian period as well that is King James was ruling the country. Again after the death of King James, Charles I became the king even at that time Drayton was writing and he was contributing to English poetry. So, Michael Drayton belongs to both Elizabethan poetry and early 17th century poetry and this period had this complex game of courtly life. Elizabeth had a stable administration, but after her there was some stability in the beginning, but then there were many disturbances due to the religious factions or fights between Catholics and Protestants. Michael Drayton found this courtly life to be too difficult, but then he was able to manage to get some kind of patronage throughout his life. The literary context is all about renaissance and reformation. Renaissance in letters, reformation in the church. It is the second one which led to lot of social changes, transformations particularly in the realm of education. Many people were able to get education. However, all educated people from poor backgrounds could not succeed in life. Success at that, at that point of time meant to become a courtier, to get a job in the government, some job or other to get associated with some patron or finally to get the grace of Queen of England. Interestingly, we find that Shakespeare and Drayton hail from the same Warwickshire area. There were many writers with less educational backgrounds including Shakespeare and Drayton. Here we have a social practice of the time that is becoming a page for some rich person or a person of social standing, a page means something like an attendant. Shakespeare was a page and similarly Drayton also became a page and these two writers like others, they became pages that is attendants and then in course of time they became writers who could write large number of pages for the English people to read for anyone to read and enjoy. Michael Drayton was not only a poet, he was also a playwright. Today Michael Drayton is remembered more by historians because he wrote historical books about England. He was a man of humble origin, but he had the gift to mingle with people of high society. Because of his ability to compose poems and dedicate them to patrons, he was able to receive support from 
many patents throughout his life. Though the government changed, though the patents changed, he continued to write, he continued to revise his own writings and publish them again and again. It was remarkable to see that Michael Drayton attempted a wide variety of poems on different topics including religion, history and geography. One of the notable works of Drayton is this longest poem Poly Albion. It is called a topographical poem about England and Wales. It has a, an astonishing collection of 30,000 lines. However, in the literary circles, Drayton is known for his famous sonnet, since there is no help, come let us kiss and part. The sonnet sequence that Drayton wrote was called Ideas Mirror. He published this volume in 1594. The first edition came out with 51 sonnets, but he went on revising this sonnet sequence throughout his life nearly about 25 years. So, we have revised editions in 1599, 1600, 1605 and 1619. Later on, Drayton reduced the title to idea. The reduction in the title perhaps referred to the platonic ideal love. Here, because it deals with the ideal love, it does not have much passion or feeling in this sonnet sequence. Drayton presents a personification of idea as a beloved. It is conjectured that the sequence might have been inspired by a lady and Goodyear, the daughter of his early patron Sir Henry Goodyear. This is a introductory sonnet to the readers, he calls it to the readers of the sonnets. Into these loves who but for passion looks at this first sight here let him lay them by and seek elsewhere in turning other books. Which better may his labour satisfy? No far fetched sigh shall ever wound my breast, love from mine eye a tear shall never ring, nor in arms my whining sonnets dressed, a libertine fantastically I sing. My verse is the true image of my mind, ever in motion still desiring change and as thus to variety incline. So, in all humours sportively I range, my muse is rightly of the English train that cannot long one fashion entertain. Drayton tells us that his verse is different from that of others, though he calls his sonnet sequence ideas. My verse, he says, is a true image of my mind. It does not imagine and write something else according to some conventions. He is also very particular about his musing, his source of inspiration to be English muse and English tradition. And again, another characteristic of this English tradition is it cannot continue with one fashion for a long time. Probably why sonnet sequence went out of fashion after the Elizabethan period, we can understand from this particular characteristic of English poetry. Next, we discuss the poem Idea 14. It is a sonnet. Here it goes. If he from heaven that flitched that living fire, condemned by Jove to endless torment be, I greatly marvel how you still go free that far beyond Prometheus did aspire. The fire he stole, although of heavenly kind, which from above he craftily did take of lifeless, of lifeless clods as living men to make, he did bestow in temper of the mind, but you broke into heaven's immortal store where virtue, honour, wit and beauty lay, which taking thence you have escaped away. 
yet stand as free as ere you did before, yet old Prometheus punished for his rape, thus poor thieves suffer when the greater escape. The epigram sums up his own understanding of life. We will examine the poem now. Let us look into the thematic contrast that is available in this poem. We can see altruism in the case of Prometheus, the classical character who went to heaven to steal fire from heaven for the sake of humanity and as a consequence he had to suffer eternally. On the other hand, we have the narcissistic feeling of the lady who has beauty for herself, who enjoys her own beauty, but she is not punished at all. This altruistic service to mankind, actually stealing fire from heaven brought life to human beings, lifeless human beings got life because of the fire from heaven brought by Prometheus. So, there is an element of crime and punishment. If we steal something, we are punished. So, Prometheus was punished. Prometheus stole fire from heaven for the sake of humanity, but he was punished eternally. On the other hand, the beloved has stolen virtue, honor, wit and beauty, many things not just fire from heaven, but escaped any, panic, any kind of punishment. She has all these virt virtue, honor, wit and beauty she has stolen them from heaven. This is the imagination of the poet you can see. This lady is not punished. Prometheus suffered for others, but this lady has lived for herself. Quite a few poetic devices can be noticed in this poem. First poetic device is allusion. It is very prominent. The whole poem is centers around the Prometheus myth. We also have alliteration in the case of filth to fire, meant to make. The beauty of this poem lies in the epigrammatic line at the end, thus poor thieves suffer when the greater escape. We also have the diction appropriate to the mythological story and also the contemporary life. The syntax is quite complex. We notice that there are many complex structures in the first 13 lines and in the last line we have a statement of complexity which stands separately from the first 13 lines. When we look into the structure rhyme and rhythm in this poem we find there are three quatrains and a couplet. It also has a volta in line 9 through that conjunction, but we have the rhyme scheme A B B A C D D C E F F E G G. The rhyming words are fire, be free, aspire, kind, take, make, mind, store, lay away, before rape, escape. Look into those words fire, aspire, kind, mind, rape, escape. We have interesting connotations. These words coming together making suggestions for us to understand the fire of aspiration, the imagination of aspiration, the mind having kindness and uh, people using this idea of rape that is in this poem we have to understand this word rape is used differently to refer to stealing or filching as the poet uses in the first line. Here rape does not refer to what we understand today. So, stealing something and escaping that is the idea that is brought into this uh, rhyme in this particular poem. We have the perfect iambic pentameter in this particular line where, where virtue, honor, weight and beauty lay where virtue, honor, wit and beauty lay and we can contrast this with the rhythm and syntax in the first line. If he from heaven that filched that living fire, 
it is not so smooth as we have in where virtue, honor, wit and beauty lay. However, we have this common iambic pentameter running throughout the poem. Let us have a picture, whole picture of this poem now. Life is a mystery, it is also a puzzle. We say God's ways are inscrutable, we can examine and find reasons for what happens why. Those who help others selflessly are punished, it is a common phenomenon that we see for ourselves. Those who help themselves somehow they are free. So, there is a question for us. Does the poet ironically criticize or genuinely admire the lady for, es for her escape? How would women readers respond to Drayton today? We have one more question relating to our own human condition. How does the situation generally apply to the human condition? Now, we are going to the second poem idea 61. This is the most famous poem of Michael Drayton found in many anthologies of English poetry. Since there is no help, come let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me and I am glad, yeah glad with all my heart that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows and when we meet at any time again, by, be it not seen in either of our brows that we one jot of formal love retain now at the last gasp of love's latest breath. When his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, when faith is kneeling by his bed of death and innocence is closing up his eyes. Now, if thou wouldest, when all have given him over from death to life, thou mightest him yet recover. We have the rhyme scheme here. This poem has a thematic contrast in the very idea of the whole poem. This can be called a separation poem or a farewell poem, but it also hints at some kind of union at the end. It suggests that love has a power to bring the dead to life. Lovers may break up with a good understanding, even, it mean, even if it means death for one or both. We have a clear picture of this separation or farewell in this poem. First, the poet introduces the idea of let us separate. Then, he explained how they will separate from each other. You get no more of me, he tells her, shake hands forever, cancel all our vows, love. Is there any love without vows to remain together forever? Pretend there was no love between us, when the love is lost, only pretension remains. When he is by deathbed, in the last days of his life, what happens? So, the conclusion of this poem is this, though might, mightest him yet recover, it is possible for the beloved to recover this love, the man from death, it is possible through love. Both these ideas of separation and union are brought together, similarly feelings of joy and sorrow are brought together and again both life and death come together in this poem of separation and perhaps of union. Some poetic devices can be seen in this poem. Irony seems to be very predominant in this poem. Here we have a line and I am glad, yeah glad with all my heart. Is the, is the poet really happy, glad to separate from his beloved? We also have personification in the case of love, passion, faith, innocence. These are all good qualities that go together in this farewell poem and actually create a stark contrast to the feeling felt by the poet or the speaker. 
We also have this poetic device called anaphora when is repeated several times and when begins other lines. Similarly, we have repetition in the case of and and now also. The whole poem consists of many imperatives in terms of syntactical structure. Sh cancel all our vows that is the kind of language we have in this poem. The structure, rhyme and rhythm again we have three quartines and a couplet. Volta in this case is found in the 11th line where there is a hint of we can unite again. There is a change in the thought process. At the beginning we have the whole thought of separation, but at the end there is an element of union as well. The rhyme scheme is this A B A B C D C D E F E F and G G. This is a Shakespearean sonnet structure. The rhyming words are part, me, heart, free, vows, again, browse, retain, breath, lies, death, eyes, over, recover. This poem seems to suggest separation is equal to death, but the poet accepts the fact though he has a lingering feeling of love for his beloved who he wants to imagine that she would come, she could come and bring him back to life. The couplet has an I rhyme and it is not a full rhyme over and recover. There is a clear flow we have in octave, but more of hesitation in the sestet obviously indicating the poet does not want to separate. We also have a dash at the end of line 13 probably dashing all hopes of the poet. Actually the poem deals with the compounded complexity of chaotically confused life of love. This is so much complex or chaotic confused because people tend to desire others or things which finally tend to destroy the people who desire. So, we, we can say we desire others, but destroy ourselves. The poem looks simple due to its conversational tone, but it is a complex poem of intricate relationships between people, especially between male and female in a hierarchical and capitalistic society. We have to remember that Drayton was supporting his large family all through his life and he did not marry and so remained a single man. In this lecture, we discussed the historical context, literary context in which Michael Drayton lived and wrote his poems. We examined Ideas Mirror published in 1594 with reference to two major sonnets, but we also saw the introductory sonnet. We also saw the introductory sonnet in which Drayton says, my verse is a true image of my mind and thereby distinguishing himself as a sonneteer in the Elizabethan period. Idea 61 is one of the most famous sonnets of Drayton which goes like this, since there is no help come let us kiss and part. We have some references for you, you may try to collect them and refer to them if possible and enjoy the poetry of Michael Drayton. Thank you.